Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is David Halperin. I'm the CEO here at Israel Policy Forum, filling in today for our uh, usual host, our board chair, Susie Gelman. Uh, I want to welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time today. And of course, welcome back our returning uh, viewers and listeners. Before we begin, I want to thank our supporters. Uh, our work, including today's program, is made possible by you. Uh, if you don't yet support our work, please do so by visiting www.israelpolicyforum.org slash support. Now on to today's briefing. Uh, one year ago, the foreign ministers of the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain joined Israel's then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and former President Donald Trump on the White House lawn to sign the Abraham Accords and officially normalize their relations with Israel. The Abraham Accords marked a historic shift in Israel-Arab state relations, as normalization had long appeared blocked by the absence of Israeli-Palestinian peace. Uh, now, this week, uh, just, I believe, uh, tomorrow and the days ahead, uh, we will have Israel's foreign minister, now foreign minister, Yair Lapid, and foreign minister, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed of the UAE, uh, in Washington to hold bilateral and trilateral talks with Secretary of State Tony Blinken, uh, during which the issues uh, of Iran and the expansion of Israel's ties with the Arab world will be high on the agenda. So today's conversation is incredibly timely to discuss the U.S. role in advancing the Abraham Accords just one year later and the week of uh, these important visits uh, with Secretary of State Blinken. And we are thrilled here at Israel Policy Forum uh, to be launching an incredibly timely study. Uh, the study now available at our website is titled The New Normal, Arab-Israeli Normalization and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. It is co-authored by our uh, Chief Policy Officer, Michael Koplow, our Policy Advisors, Shira Efron, and Evan Gottesman, all of whom are with us today. Uh, and I should note that it also includes a forward by our board member and former US ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk. Uh, I encourage you all, uh, it is now available on our website and you could get it directly at www.israelpolicyforum.org slash the new normal, uh, or just visit our website and you will, you will find the links to it there. Now, this report analyzes to what extent, uh, if at all, the Abraham Accords can help advance a two-state outcome to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And again, we're thrilled to be joined by Michael, Shira, and Evan today uh, for a deep dive uh, with our colleagues on this new study, uh, deep dive into the contents of the report and its recommendations. Uh, as always, uh, we encourage your participation. Uh, you can ask questions of our speakers. Please type your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And as always, a recording of this broadcast will be available later on our website, the same place uh, that you'll go to to uh, download this, this new report coming out today. So with that, Shira, Michael, and Evan, thanks uh, for joining us. Thanks for this new report uh, and all the hard work that went into it. And, and I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity uh, to, to help you all launch this study and unpack it with you today. And Shira, let's start with you. Um, perhaps we could just start with the, from the beginning. What's, what's the goal of this report? Uh, what was the impetus for writing it? Maybe you could walk us through the approach and methodology uh, that you all uh, uh, utilized to, 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 to drive this forward. Sure, thank you, David. It's great to be with you all here launching this report, which uh, turns out to be quite timely with the events in Washington this week. So I think there's no uh, question that the Abraham Accords represent one of the most developing and exciting foreign policy developments in the region for decades, really. Um, but the way uh, in which they were achieved and the way that they were designed uh, sidelined the Palestinian issue. And as an organization that is continuously seeking um, ways to advance Israeli Palestinian solutions to the Israeli Palestinian conflict, we thought that how can we continue to advance normalization, but in a way that advances um, the Pal Israeli Palestinian peace process, if you can call it the peace process, um, and not push the Palestinians aside. And, you know, we looked around and uh, we found a lot of. There were a lot of uh, um, 
OPEDs and analysis saying uh, the Abram Accords can do that. And if only the Palestinians would realize that it's really good for them, it can be. But there was no detail or process. And this was sort of a gap that we wanted to bridge. Uh, and there was, of course, a political element to it also. Um, with the Biden administration, obviously, um, normalization has been a bipartisan policy in the United States uh, for many, many years. And it is good and it is in US interest. However, the transactional nature of these accords uh, and their association with the Trump administration, uh, we sensed uh, made the Biden administration a, a little bit reluctant um, to sort of put their own, you know, turn them into, continue the way, uh, continue advancing them the way uh, has been done by the previous administration. Um, and we felt that we can, you know, marry their uh, interest in advancing normalization, but also in their interest of uh, trying to repair ties with the Palestinians, uh, keeping the window open for a two-state solution and help them by providing really concrete recommendations uh, with the hope that they would uh, recommend, uh, adopt some of these recommendations. And I think it's pretty exciting because it's more that you mentioned by the two, two foreign ministers means that a year on, uh, the Biden administration seems to be a little bit more uh, involved and interested in those. Um, so I'll stop here. Thanks. Um, just to, to back up a bit, I'm gonna, I want to turn to Evan um, to really look at, you know, how have things changed? Uh, what did Israel's relationships with the Arab states look like before the Arab uh, Abraham Accords, particularly as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian arena? And, and how have the accords altered the geopolitical landscape, if at all, for in the Middle East for Israelis and Palestinians uh, within their conflict? Well, throughout the span of the Arab-Israeli conflict, Israel has always been unrecognized by all or now some of the Arab states. Um, and there's always been this link between the wider Arab-Israeli conflict, between Israel and different Arab states, and, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, which developed alongside that. And that link existed for a long time, even among states that might have been uh, amenable to ties with Israel or, or, or have proven later to be amenable to ties with Israel. So it wasn't just a link, say, that was being uh, pushed by the most radical uh, states like Syria or, or Iraq uh, under Saddam. Uh, and the, the link between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Arab-Israeli normalization uh, came through in a number of uh, uh, policies and initiatives uh, set forth by the Arab states. And, and it kind of shows a shift in evolution from the initial complete rejectionism that characterized the, the Arab state approach uh, something that we might see in things like the, the infamous three no's from the Khartoum conference in 1967, moving up to these ideas of normalization for peace, uh, which came out uh, first and part of the, the what's called the FOD plan in the 1980s, later in, in the more well-known Arab Peace Initiative in 2002, which was put out by the Arab League under Saudi leadership, essentially the idea that if you have a two-state solution, then you can have relations between Israel and the different Arab states. Um, and there was also a trend that when Israeli-Palestinian relations were good and progress towards Israeli-Palestinian peace was good, relations between Israel and the Arab states could develop. You see that during the Oslo process, the opening of different trade and represent, uh, representative offices of Israel in some of the Gulf countries, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, Shimon Peres, and some of their advisors visited some of those countries during the Oslo years. And you even see some meetings uh, uh, between uh, Perez when he's deputy prime minister later uh, in the late 2000s, foreign minister Tzipi Ligny, um, and some of those countries also, when you have, again, a more uh, conciliatory-minded government in Israel vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinian issue. And then on the flip side, when Israeli-Palestinian relations are not good, uh, Arab-Israeli relations sour. During the Second Intifada, Morocco uh, cuts off ties that it had opened with Israel, these trade offices that opened during the Oslo process closed, and so on and so forth. What I think we see with the Abraham Accords, you know, going back to your question, is not so much that the Abraham Accords are altering the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East, but that they are a product of an altered geopolitical landscape in which uh, these countries see uh, more benefits for having relations with Israel. And I think before the Abraham Accords, the prevailing uh, wisdom about Arab state-Israel ties, um, again with the exception, by the way, of Jordan and Egypt, which had, had ties with Israel separately, 
um, and, and a view that, that I admit that I subscribe to myself was that essentially these countries, a lot of them had back channel ties with Israel and there was no uh, reason for them to move that into the public. Uh, when in reality, it's clear that many of these countries determined that they no longer wanted uh, to uh, have their ties with Israel uh, linked inextricably to the Palestinian conflict, um, and in fact wanted to compartmentalize those two issues. Great. So um, I, I want to get to as many audience questions as possible. So I just want to remind you all that you can type the questions in the Q&A box. But before we go to questions, of course, we want to unpack what, what does your report actually say? What are the findings and recommendations uh, of this report? So I want to turn to you, Michael. Uh, what what did, did you all conclude? Uh, can the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, arena, can the Abraham Accords uh, be utilized, leveraged in some way to advance a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, based on a two-state outcome? Thanks, David. Um, so we have six core recommendations in this report, and I'll go through, the, through them relatively quickly, and, and obviously we can go into uh, greater detail on any of them. Uh, in, in Q&A, um, but before the six recommendations, there is one under undergirding principle here, which is that for any of this to work, we need a bigger, more involved American role. Um, we saw how important the United States was in the initial round of normalization, where the US didn't necessarily initiate it, uh, but certainly did a lot to make it happen and pushed it forward. And it involved, of course, all sorts of U.S. policy incentives, um, whether whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, we can uh, we can discuss. Um, but without a really involved U.S. role, I think it's going to be tough not only for normalization itself to proceed, but even tougher for normalization to proceed in a way that brings in the Palestinians and makes some progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front. So, with that in mind, we have six core recommendations here. Um, the first is to capitalize on Israel's desire to expand normalization rather than see it arrested. Normalization is obviously very popular among Israelis, perhaps more popular than any other, any other issue or agenda item. Uh, and we saw when the UAE first established ties with Israel uh, in summer, uh, summer 2020, um, we, saw this, uh, we saw this play out where the UAE said, you can have normalization with us or you can have annexation, but you really can't have both. And the popularity of normalization was used to overcome what would have been, uh, you know, certainly we, I know we agree on, uh, on this side, uh, would have been a, a pretty disastrous Israeli policy and certainly one that would have been uh, disastrous for the Palestinians as well and, and for two states. And so uh, using that as the model going forward, if we're gonna see more normalization, um, it's very popular with Israelis and that can be used to try and roll back perhaps some of the more damaging things uh, that Israel may be contemplating with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Second and related is understanding Saudi Arabia as the big prize here. Um, Saudi Arabia is extremely unlikely to normalize without major progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front. And what that means is that you can have an approach in which normalization with Saudi Arabia proceeds in stages where if the Saudis agree to, uh, to advance normalization with moves toward Israel, such as permanent overflight rights, or such as opening a trade office in Tel Aviv, um, that, can, uh, that can come with Israeli political steps in return, uh, whether it be on settlements, whether it be on uh, redesignating uh, parts of Area C, um, whether it be on, uh, on demolitions and evictions, uh, you know, this can also proceed in, in stages where uh, Saudi Arabia normalizes in return for progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front that, of course, will still fall well short uh, of, a, of a, a, final status, uh, a final status agreement. Um, third is paying some attention to, uh, you know, what, we, what we've been calling the old normalizers, uh, Egypt and Jordan, um, although in reality, they're not really old normalizers. You know, they established peace treaties with Israel in a lot of ways, though, I think you can argue that they never actually normalized relations. Um, and that creates an opportunity because there is plenty of space for them to upgrade their own relations with Israel. There is a lot of evidence that Egypt and Jordan feel a bit, uh, feel a bit left out. Uh, they have some FOMO on uh, what's taking place between Israel and the UAE and, uh, and other Abraham Accord states. 
And so uh, using Egypt and Jordan's desire to, to not really miss out on the party um, is helpful, particularly because Egypt and Jordan are the two countries outside of uh, Israel and the Palestinians, the two countries that tend to have the deepest interest in Israeli-Palestinian affairs because, because it uh, impacts them directly. And so uh, the more they're involved, the more that normalization will uh, involve the Israeli-Palestinian sphere. And, uh, and at the same time, you can actually get uh, these two countries that in a lot of ways have a very cold peace with Israel, uh, move them toward actually more, normal, more normalized relations with Israel. Uh, fourth is focusing on Gaza and recognizing that uh, Gaza, Gaza is an area where there are obvious pathways forward for cooperation among Israel and Arab states that both benefit the Palestinians and, and reduce Hamas influence and uh, allow normalizing states to, to be a bit more involved. Um, you know, we've seen uh, for a while Israel's reliance on Qatar and, its, uh, and at the same time its frustration that Qatar is so deeply involved in Gaza given Qatari support for Hamas. And if there's a way to have uh, Egypt uh, and in particular the Emiratis more involved in Gaza, um, that can reduce Qatari influence and, and build on more Israeli, Egyptian uh, and Emirati cooperation. Uh, in addition, the improving ties right now between Qatar and other GCC countries where we've seen the Qataris look to repair ties with the Saudis, with the Emiratis, um, it may be creating an opening where some of these countries can have more outside influence in Gaza without the Qataris objecting. Um, and at the same time, Qatar's desire to improve relations with these states may lead it to try to exercise more leverage over Hamas in order to meet the concerns of Egypt and, and the UAE and other states. Uh, fifth is urging Palestinian involvement in the Abraham Accords and in some of the deals that have emerged. Um, one of the um, one of the drawbacks to the Abraham Accords is that in a lot of ways it was designed to purposely cut the Palestinians out. Um, you know, and in some ways this was so that the Palestinians wouldn't continue to have a veto over bilateral relations between Israel and other states. But it has also meant that moving forward, when you see some of these deals and new relationships developing, the Palestinians are not part of it. And if the Palestinians are brought into the process in a greater way, it will begin to uh, reduce Palestinian uh, reluctance or and even opposition to the Abraham Accords. And so when we think about agreements on trade or the environment or particularly tourism, these can all involve the Palestinian Authority in some way. And particularly now that Israel has this stated interest in strengthening the Palestinian Authority, um, including Palestinians in some of these initiatives will do exactly that. Uh, you know, and if there are significant on the ground achievements uh, that help strengthen the PA and that bring benefits to ordinary Palestinians that are linked to the normalization process, you know, we should hopefully see less Palestinian opposition and a way to really incorporate Israeli-Palestinian progress into normalization. And then finally, uh, is allowing Abraham Accord states to take credit for breakthroughs. The more that normalizing states can take credit for progress on Israeli-Palestinian issues, the easier time future normalizing states will have in terms of normalizing relations with Israel and reducing some of the domestic opposition. Because as much as we all celebrate the Abraham Accords, in most countries in the region, normalization with Israel is still very unpopular among public opinion. And so being able to point to successes where states can say, hey, because of our relationship with Israel, we were able to do A, B, and C for the Palestinians, um, it will create incentives for some of these more reluctant states to move forward. Um, again, possibly ease Palestinian objections to the Abraham Accords and also allow some of the countries that are already on board to the extent they can take credit, much as the UAE did for halting annexation, uh, to the extent they can take credit for uh, other positive developments on the Israeli-Palestinian front, it will just make normalization more popular uh, in their countries as well and hopefully uh, create sort of a, a cascade effect where normalization is seen as benefiting as benefiting everyone. So uh, those are our six core recommendations. Uh, as I said, um, you know, we go into greater detail on all of these, uh, but that's uh, that's the basic rundown. All right, and I, I should mention there's a one pager, there's an executive summary, or you can read uh, uh, all 60 pages or, or, or whatnot, uh, depending on your, on your appetite for digging in. Um, 
I, I have to say, I have a questions I had planned to, to ask, but there are just so many uh, good questions that have already come through that I think we should we could start right in with um, some of the audience questions because there really are a, a lot, and uh, I want to encourage those uh, questions to keep coming. You can do so by typing them in the the Q and A box. We're going to start with Ishan Tharoor from the the Washington Post, who who writes in. Um, the question for the panel is, is, is sort of related a bit to, to Michael, what you're saying about going forward and also what Shira mentioned about the legacy of, of the Trump administration, which is how do you view the Biden administration taking these accords now forward? Should we see what's unfolding as a continuation of the Trump legacy or are there clear signs of departure that are important to note? And I'll, I'll start with you, Michael. Um, yeah. Sure. So, you know, we see uh, we see this week, of course, with uh, with Yair Lapid, uh, the Israeli foreign minister, uh, and ABZ, the Emirati foreign minister, in DC, uh, meeting with Blinken, and, and they're touting the Abraham Accords. Um, and tomorrow, there's going to be a trilateral meeting. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, this is uh, a continuation of of the of the Trump legacy. You know, we've seen these types of meetings and, and imagery before. Um, and, and I think that you know. Every, every, it's no secret the Biden administration seems to have been somewhat reluctant uh, to really embrace normalization. I think part of that is because their priorities lie elsewhere. I think part of it is that they view normalization as one of the signature Trump foreign policy achievements. Um, and so they don't want to embrace it fully. Um, you know, to my mind, and, and really to, uh, I, I will take liberty of speaking for, for Shira and Evan here as well, um, one of the reasons that we that we focus on how normalization and Israeli-Palestinian issues can intersect is because you know, we all believe that if the Biden administration wants to take the Abraham Accords and really chart its own course um, and uh, advance normalization in a way that the Biden administration can own and really put its own spin on it, this seems like an obvious way to do it. Um, now, it's it's difficult, right? But the uh, I, I think possibly the largest the largest section in this report. Um, isn't the recommendations, it's, it's us noting all of the various barriers to having normalization proceed in a way that benefits the Israeli-Palestinian sphere. There are barriers pretty much on all sides, uh, you know, from the US to Israel, uh, to the normalizing states, to the Palestinians. Um, so this is, this is not going to be easy. It's, it's a heavy lift. But I think that if the Biden administration um, were to actively take normalization and uh, try to figure out how it could proceed and, you know, and building on what is an obvious Trump success, um, but do it in a way that actually advances Israeli-Palestinian peace uh, and doesn't, doesn't leave them aside and doesn't try to wall that off, you know, that would be uh, one of the best ways that they could take normalization, uh, move it forward in a productive way and really, and really own the policy as their own. Yeah, um, th th it's interesting. I mean, I, I think as a good follow-up, um, I have a question from Bill Neiman. Uh, who asked, how does the mentality that the road to Washington is through Jerusalem shape the normalization prospects of Egypt and Jordan, which have peace treaties uh, uh, with Israel, but no doubt would like to, uh, or that we've seen signs of those, those developing, uh, those relationships developing further, but how does it shape the normalization prospects of Egypt, Jordan, and others in the region? And most importantly, Bill asks, if the U.S. becomes more disengaged, what does that mean for normalization? And perhaps, um, Michael, I'll let you decide. Maybe Shira, you could tackle this one. All right, hi, Bill. Uh, you know, it's it's a really good question. And I think you put your finger right, right where it is. We don't necessarily think normalization cannot continue without, um, without American involvement. There are processes in the region. You could arguably say that the back channels between Israel and some of these countries, right? Normalization didn't occur in one day. It was a gradual process uh, developed, uh, thinking that the US was gonna withdraw from the region. Um, there are shared interests, uh, economic security ones. Um, we see the US involvement as uh, an accelerator, uh, one. And we are also, and I think Evan pointed, pointed this, to this also, um, without, uh, U.S. administration dedicated to this issue, it's our sense that the issue of Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict would be left behind. And, you know, speaking now from Tel Aviv, as, as, as 
happy uh, we all are. And this is an amazing achievement, right? These Abraham Accords really changing a tectonic shift in the region. Uh, the fact is that there are, you know, over 5 million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, additional 400,000 in Jerusalem, um, 2.1 uh, Israeli Arabs, Palestinian descent. And the, 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 if, if you think um, that Israel should continue to be a Jewish and democratic state living side by side next to a Palestinian entity, if this is still possible, we, we, we believe a US um, involvement, a US leadership on this is the only way to marry those two things together. If I could just jump in there for a moment, you know, the notion that the, the road to Washington runs through Israel, I think has characterized the relationships between a lot of these Arab states and a lot of other states in the region and the US for many decades. And it's evident in the way that previous uh, diplomatic initiatives have come out. Um, I don't want to suggest that better relations with the US are the only reason that these countries want relations with Israel. Uh, but you can very often find a US related incentive in previous initiatives, whether it's the initiatives of the 1980s and the controversy then around uh, the, the sale of uh, military systems to Saudi Arabia, the Arab Peace Initiative in 2002, coming only a couple of months after the September 11th attacks when there was a lot more scrutiny around the Saudis. And now even some of the things that the uh, countries that are party to the Abraham Accords uh, got just last year, um, which, you know, the interest in relations with the U.S. Is, is both an opportunity and a challenge because it shows that there's potential for leverage, but you also have to weigh what kinds of uh, concessions the U.S. is making, what can realistically be made, and also whether or not what was given under the previous administration set the bar too high or if we can come down from that. Great. Um, I, I want to try to combine questions because we have uh, so many and I'd like to, to get to them. They're really good questions. So, for example, Alan Minton uh, wrote that he was concerned the possibility of apparently warm relations turning cold, noting that after peace agreements, uh, the sort of honeymoon phase uh, be between Israel and Egypt, for example, and now we have a cold peace between Israel and Egypt. And we wanted uh, wanted you all to comment on the possibility of what appears to be warm relations turning cold in the future. Uh, what is the possibility of that? And somewhat relatedly, uh, our friend Ori Nier from Americans for Peace Now wrote, what is the role of public diplomacy? And do these agreements have the potential uh, to help make inroads into the hearts and minds of Israelis to enhance Israeli support for peace ultimately with the Palestinians? Uh, maybe I'll start with the first and um, I don't know, Shira as the Israeli on, uh, on you, as the Israeli here, maybe should answer the second. Um, so on the first, I think it's unlikely that we see normalization turn into a cold peace. Um, you know, we, we've all seen the huge numbers of Israelis that have gone uh, to the UAE, you know, I don't think that's something that uh, that happened in the in the early days of uh, of the Israel-Egypt peace treaty. You know, we've seen uh, already uh, huge numbers, huge trade numbers between uh, Israel and the UAE. Again, that's not something that we that we really saw between between Israel and Egypt. Um, so I think it's unlikely, but you know, and this is where the this is where the Israeli-Palestinian angle comes in. You know, if there is something that will transform these warm relations into cooler ones, it's going to be real um, difficulties on the Israeli-Palestinian front. You know, when, uh, when the fighting happened in May um, between Israel and Hamas over Gaza, we didn't see any of the Abraham Accords states break off ties with Israel or, or, or cancel any deals they had, they had with Israel. Um, but we did see relatively harsh statements from Abraham Accord states, including the Emiratis, who, you know, in theirs, I think notably, you know, referred to uh, Israeli-occupied Jerusalem, um, not the type of language that we had seen from them before. Um, you know, and that was, keep in mind, fighting that was relatively brief. Uh, it was, you know, between Israel and Hamas, which is, you know, obviously represents uh, sort of the, the branch of the Palestinian national movement uh, that, that the Emiratis themselves are, are deeply opposed to. Um, so, you know, if we were to see a scenario in which there was more widespread or wide-scale fighting between 
Israelis and Palestinians. Um, you know, I think it would be hard for uh, for normalizing countries to maintain the same warmth and depth of relations. And let's also remember that normalization was basically kicked off um, with a pledge from Israel to temporarily suspend West Bank annexation. So if Israel takes drastic steps in the future, um, there's no way of knowing you know, what it will do to normalization, but you know, I think it certainly has the potential to, to impact it in a, in a negative way. Sure, do you wanna- yeah, I think, this yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just no. add to that, that, um, you know, the, 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 it, this is a, a different type of uh, peace deals than signed with e Egypt and Jordan that really came after there, you know, there was active war. Um, so at the level of the population, there was a different sentiment toward uh, Israel, both those countries than, than you normalizing countries that were always like second third circle and even third circle to fighting. Uh, we also, Need to understand that you know ties between Egypt and Jordan, and Israel were uh, always uh, what they call G to G, government to government. And in recent years, and now they're trying to repair this, what we would call M to M, which was really military to military, but not at the people's level. Israelis don't feel comfortable walking in the streets of Cairo, uh, in Amman. Um, uh, very small. Uh, there's anti-Semitism that's pretty ev evident uh, in some places. Uh, Got to give credit both to King Hussein and uh, Sisi that they've been working on it and renovating things. But this is not. It's very, very different. Um, and when we go to when we speak about uh, public diplomacy and other initiatives, there's big investment here in those elements. Um, so tourism. Uh, is huge, interfaith initiatives, serving kosher foods, AGC opening an office, those things work, Orion, you know, and I just saw a poll by the Israel Democracy Institute, it's a huge, it's all Israel, the, the, the numbers, I mean, it's one of the most popular foreign policy issues that is uh, in Israel, among Israeli, uh, among the Israeli Jewish population. Uh, I would just add that it's true we didn't hear uh, none of the normalization countries um, sort of reverse normalization uh, in response to the May fighting. However, we need to remember it was only 11 days, pretty contained. What we did hear is that behind the scenes, there were private calls by Emirati and other countries' officials to Israeli officials. And not just one, a few calls that said that if this goes on and escalates, and Jerusalem is always it's such a hot spot, uh, they, would have to, they would have to act. So um, I think these are very robust ties but uh, serious escalation could, uh, of course, have implications. So one of the questions, of course, uh, you know, in, in part re related on how Israelis may view peace with the Palestinians is how Palestinians also view this process of normalization. We have a lot of questions about, and I'm sorry, I'm not naming them all, but there's quite a lot of folks who've, who've asked questions about what do the Palestinians make of all this? And of course, uh, when Abraham Accords were first announced, the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, harshly condemned those states that normalized relations with Israel, uh, labeled them as betraying the Palestinian cause. Maybe, maybe Evan, I'll turn to you for this one. Is there, is there any uh, indication the Palestinian leadership would change its its negative view of the Abraham Accords, and 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 what can be done to alleviate? Uh, in, in some ways, the Palestinian sense of being abandoned by the Arab world so they can reap benefits from the normalization agreements as well and, and really change the way they, they view this uh, rather than as a challenge into, into one that, that is an opportunity. Well, I would start off by saying that the Palestinian reaction to different states last year opening relations with Israel uh, was not uniformly negative, although I would hesitate to say that for any of these countries, there, it was positive, but there was a range of reactions from the most severe in the case of the UAE and Bahrain, where the Palestinian uh, envoys were recalled um, from Abu Dhabi and Manama, later returned actually. Uh, and then what happened, for example, when Morocco restored its ties with Israel, and there was a call between the King of Morocco and Mahmoud Abbas, and not the same uh, you know, fire and fury uh, from the PLO and the Palestinian Authority on that issue. And, and there are a whole host of reasons going into the different relations that the Palestinians have with those countries. Um, but, you know, I think here what we can hope for is not necessarily that the Palestinians are going to come out enthusiastically saying, you know, we, we want these countries to be opening up relations with Israel, because from their perspective, 
Um, I think this is always going to be something of a contravention of the, the Arab Peace Initiative, the idea that normalization would come after a two-state outcome. But if you can get some of these incentives for the Palestinians and real, real incentives that Michael began to touch on earlier, uh, but things like uh, expanding uh, parts of Area C or moratoriums on demolitions that have real uh, impact on uh, Palestinian livelihood and also are done with a, a concrete political horizon, you know, acknowledging that this is not just a quality of life conflict, um, but that, that there are real political issues behind this. Um, things like uh, extending some of the benefits of the uh, future agreements with Israel to the Palestinians, so any kind of free trade zones that are opened up between Israel and these states, extending those to the Palestinian Authority as well, I think that can mollify uh, some of the, the sentiment. Again, I, I don't think that you'll, you'll ever have the Palestinian Authority outside of the context of a two-state outcome uh, jumping up and down enthusiastic for these agreements, but you can certainly prevent uh, something of the blow up, or at least try to prevent something of the blow up that happened, uh, for example, with the UAE and Bahrain last year. So, you know, staying on this theme of, of how the Palestinians view this, we have a, another sort of basket of questions, I might probably say, uh, that deal with the, the ongoing split uh, between the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and I think there's a, a, a question here, perhaps I'll turn to you, Shira, which is, you know, how, if at all, do increased normalized ties between Israel and the Arab states, and particularly the already normalized uh, relations with the UAE, for example, is there a, a, a role for uh, some of these states uh, to be more active in the talks between uh, the PA and Hamas, for example, and the split between Gaza and the West Bank? And, and what, if any, role could they, could they be playing uh, in, in Gaza specifically? And frankly, is there any appetite uh, we've had some questions to that effect, too, from the audience. Is there any appetite uh, from these countries to engage uh, more uh, in depth uh, on these issues? Um, so good question, and, and a few of them. I don't think there's- I've done that, that one. You can, right. you can pick one that. and share the others, yes. <laughs> um, there doesn't seem to be, for the reasons we uh, explained be before, um, there's, there isn't any appetite to go to get into the thorniest issues on the Palestinian side, right? This complicates things. Uh, in Gaza, with the PA, these countries have also, there are other, right? There's such hostility between um, the government in um, Abu Dhabi and the Palestinian Authority that's been going on for over a decade. So there are many, many, many issues there, but let's, let's, let's just unpack it. Let's go to Gaza first, it's separate from um, reconciliation or reconciliation, say, between the Palestinians. You know, in Gaza, interestingly, during the, the May fighting, and uh, Michael alluded to this, there was um, all of a sudden, people realized in Israel that the policy in the past few years of the previous government has been um, funneling money to Gaza um, with the hope that it would produce quiet and for a long time and stability for a long time. It, worked pretty well. I mean, we haven't seen a major escalation since 2014, although there were incendiary balloons all the time, and they were sort of like uh, giving money, funneling money to Gaza. And, you know, there are 2.1 million Palestinians in Gaza. It's very important to invest in Gaza for humanitarian development and other issues. The problem is that a lot of this money went straight to Hamas's hand at the behest of Israel. And the country that was funding it all was Qatar. Uh, it was the only country that wanted to fund anything in Gaza. Um, it was so, to be honest, really, with you know planes landing with cash in Ben Gurion Airport and Israeli IDF soldiers driving them to Gaza, handing over to maybe maybe an intermediary to Hamas's hands. During the May fighting, um, many Israelis said, "Okay, now we have this new Arab friends, um, primarily the UAE, that has the you know the ability to fund, and they will substitute Qatar." So guess what? We are what four months after this. No one is substituting Qatar. No one jumps in. Um, and we're back at Qatar uh, funding and the means with which they're funding. Now, I, I, on the personal level, I don't have so much money with the source of the funding. It's the way in which it was um, done, but no other country would do it the way uh, Qatar does it. Um, there's no appetite, but there is a way of doing it. What we've heard that if 
those countries, I'm referring primarily to the UAE, are, um, they're not willing to be a wallet. They're not gonna underwrite the current situation. But if there's a strategy toward Gaza, which, and they're called upon by the United States primarily, maybe by the Europeans, a broader strategy that would be led by the Egyptians that have an interest and a stake. They have appetite for being involved because they have no choice, Gaza's right at the border. Um, the UAE would consider being involved. And this is sort of, we go back to <laughs> the earlier parts of, of the, the reports, the recommendations, we're talking about the involvement of Egypt and the involvement of um, uh, the US. On reconciliation, we do believe that first, um, there could be support for Egyptian uh, attempts to reconcile between the parties and Egypt has been trying uh, tirelessly. I don't think this is coming. We heard Ihe Sinwar in Gaza saying that as long as Abu is there, reconciliation between the two is not likely. And we don't know, but at one point, um, leadership will change uh, and then that could happen. Um, and another positive things that I think that can be done, we have to be very explicit about it. We talk about concessions that Israel needs to make uh, toward the Palestinians to make them happy about it. But there are a lot of concessions that the Palestinians also have to make. And they have to be um, accountable and to have a government that provides uh, services to its citizens. And we believe that uh, an urge pressure from these countries can really help, uh, help achieve that. So, um, and part of this accountability is also ensuring that the PA uh, does what it needs to do according to existing agreements also in Gaza. Uh, they've been reluctant, reluctant to do so. Shira, just before we move on to the next question, Evelyn Kenvin uh, typed in while you were answering that, uh, what Qatar's interest is uh, in Hamas and Gaza? What, what's the driving factor that leads Qatar to be, to be uh, as engaged as it is in the Gaza situation? So first of all, they're just supporters of Hamas and Muslim Brotherhood ideological uh, linkages. Uh, there's also something that we can talk about. Uh, Qatar played its cards very, very well. If you remember, Qatar uh, started paying, uh, making his payments in Gaza in 2018 when the PA basically, Palestinian Authority basically pulled out. He had this vacuum, created a window, opened the door, $360 million a year, and many, many other things. Uh, but it bought them a lot of influence. It bought them influence in Israel, with Israel. Very strong influence, I might say. Um, it bought them very good, very strong influence uh, in Washington. And when the Emiratis and the Saudis, they tried to boycott uh, Qatar, if you remember, um, the landlord country, they're trying to uh, um, have this boycott of Qatar. They were talking to the, the Trump administration about how bad Qatar is. You had the Israelis saying, wait, you know what? But they're helping us in Gaza and they're the only ones helping us. So it buys influence and ideologically they're aligned with it. Um, and again, I must say that if they're willing to give $360 million to Gaza and that can get services for the Gazans, the Gaza population, I don't have any problem with it. I have a problem when it goes without accountability to lists of 100,000 uh, families that based on no criteria, if they're poor or not poor, uh, not in kind, cash money, um, this is just not the way to do development. Um, and this, this is the problem. It's not with Qatar per se as an actor, is the way in which this was done. Yeah, so I wanna just in, uh, uh, keep those questions coming. I know we've had some terrific ones thus far. You can type questions by uh, clicking on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, a lot of these questions, of course, are uh, can be summed up really by <laughs> with the question of where, where do we go from here? Where is all of this headed? Uh, there have been reports um, and some speculation of Arab states that might normalize relations with Israel in in the near future. Um, Michael, perhaps you could you could tackle the this kind of core questions of where do you see uh, this Arab Israeli normalization uh, uh, trend, if you will, or process? Where where do you where do you see it going from here? The Trump administration. Um... They created a model that that makes makes it a bit hard to a bit hard to to follow because um, the model they created was if you want to normalize with Israel you will get something big from the United States something that may not make sense in terms of uh, American interest right and so you know with the UAE and Israel for instance the UAE wanted something from Israel they wanted annexation halted and you know ties between the UAE and Israel. Had been steadily developing for uh, for a decade, and so you know I think the UAE had a 
had a serious bilateral interest on its own in normalizing relations with Israel. But to get it over the line, you know, you had this deal for uh, 50 F-35s and 18 Reaper drones from the United States. Um, and then you had Morocco, which um, didn't ask for anything from Israel. Uh, it asked for US recognition of Western Sahara, making the United States only the second country in the world to do so. Uh, and then Sudan, which, you know, I should note, still hasn't actually normalized relations with Israel. That agreement still has not been signed or implemented. Um, Again, it wanted nothing from, from Israel. What it, want, what it wanted was to get off the US uh, State Department, uh, state sponsors of terrorism list and wanted congressional legislation indem indemnifying Sudan from all terrorism lawsuits other than those arising from 9-11. Now, you know, those are all pretty heavy incentives um, to go ahead and normalize relations with Israel. Now, there are two problems. Problem one, is that even if there are countries that are inclined to normalize relations with Israel, and you know everybody here has probably heard chatter about uh, Oman and, and Indonesia and Malaysia, um, at this point, uh, you know particularly for countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, they're very unlikely to normalize relations with Israel without getting a big payoff, um, because that's the model that has been set. Um, and obstacle number two is that. The Biden administration um, is not going to proceed down that same path. Now, when I say obstacle, I don't say that um, in a pejorative way. Uh, you know, none of us think that this was a good model, and you know, none of us would advocate that the U.S. keep on handing out these big giveaways that may not make sense uh, and that, frankly, aren't related to actual normalization. Um, but that, is, that does create an obstacle. And you know, if you're Indonesia or Malaysia, and you were at the end of the Trump administration basically negotiating with the United States for kind of every, every last, you know, every last thing you could extract. Uh, and then President Biden came into office. At this point, you know, given that it's not as if relations with Israel between, you know, for Indonesia and Malaysia are a pressing issue, at this point, you may as well wait until 2025, see if there's a, a different president who's more willing to meet your demand. And so, you know, I think that because of that model, you know, under the current circumstances, it's going to be difficult for normalization to really proceed um, kind of in a, in a big way, even leaving aside the Palestinian angle to this. You know, uh, again, I'd probably, probably point to Oman as the most likely, uh, as the most likely next target. But, um, you know, there was a lot of talk, uh, there was a lot of talk a year ago about 10 countries being on the verge of normalizing relations. You know, I don't think that we're likely to see that anytime soon. So, you know, one of the topics on the agenda uh, this week in Washington, when Secretary Blinken meets with uh, the foreign ministers of Israel and the UAE, of course, is going to be the issue of Iran. And it's clear that Iran is uh, a major factor in driving a, a number of these countries to uh, align and, and coordinate. I thought that Leon Weintraub just typed in a question that was that was quite interesting. I'd like to hear your, your reactions, which is that uh, his question is, is the failure to make progress due to differences between Palestinians and Gulf states. So is this growing gap between uh, the Palestinians and, uh, and the Gulf states and their reaction to normalization, um, does that open a door for greater Iranian influence in the area? Uh, how does Iran's influence, uh, it, you know, how is, is this growing trend of normalization impacting Iranian influence within the Palestinian arena in particular? I can, uh, I, I can, I, I can go for it. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure it's gonna, I'm not sure it's gonna make a, a big deal because you know within within kind of the split Palestinian polity, you have one side, the Palestinian Authority, that is not inclined to uh, develop real close ties with Iran, irrespective of whatever bad blood is taking place between the Palestinians and the Saudis, or the, or you know in particular the Palestinians and the Emiratis, um, and on the other side. You know, you have Hamas and Islamic Jihad, which obviously are inclined uh, to turn to Iran and to be supported by Iran. And that also isn't a function of, uh, of bad blood between the PA and, uh, and some, of, some of the normalizing states. So I have no doubt that Iran will try to, uh, you know, to insert itself however it can. And I have no doubt that Iran will try to insert a wedge or an even greater wedge uh, between the Palestinian Authority and some of these other states, um, but I, you know, I think the current iteration of the PA isn't terribly inclined to turn to the Iranians. I, I think that uh, Abu Mazen and, and PA leadership understand um, that 
you know, their, their support traditionally comes from uh, the Sunni states and that's gonna be the case in the future. And that um, rather than do something rash and, and you know, turn their backs on, because uh, it's not just one state, right? It's not just the Emiratis who would be turning their backs on the Egyptians and the Jordanians and the Saudis and everyone else. Um, you know, I, I don't think they're really inclined to do that. So just a follow-up to the previous issue that we touched on in terms of the way the Palestinians view this uh, growing relations, Alan Warshaw, um, wrote in, uh, you know, <laughs> I think it's the best if I just read it, which was, um, you know, the, the notion that the Palestinians don't actually appreciate that with the Abraham Accords annexation was, was pulled from the table, um, that in theory that should be used, that should be viewed as a significant positive benefit for the Palestinians. Uh, he asked, was that benefit marketed or spun poorly, or, or was that something the U.S. should have done better? Um, or why didn't the Palestinians view annexation being taken off the table as, as a net positive? Sure, you want to take this one or Evan? Evan, go for it. Sorry. Um, you know, I, I think, first of all, while I think all of us here would agree that it was a, a major benefit to have formal annexation withdrawn, uh, that's the product of something that was already seen as harmful to the Palestinians being put on the table and then taken back, both Israeli plans that were Israeli generated and also this coming just a couple of months after the release of the Trump administration's peace to prosperity plan, which put that US administration on the record as supporting Israeli annexation formally of, of as much as 30% of the West Bank and then the creation of basically a, a rump Palestine that had no uh, effective uh, you know, form, forms of, of sovereignty. It, it wouldn't look like an independent country in any recognizable way that, that we would think of one. So I think, I think that comes from some of it. And I think it's a lot of the way that the Trump administration marketed the Abraham Accords afterwards. They were very clear that this was about compartmentalizing the conflict. That, uh, you know, if you go back and look at what some of President Trump's advisors, if you look at what uh, I think was Jared Kushner said uh, following the, the release of the Accords, he had a line some, somewhere along the lines of this is a way for uh, countries to be able to pursue their own interests, speaking of, you know, implicitly of the, the Arab countries, without having to think about the Palestinians. And, and I think uh, they were very explicit about that. They didn't really seek to uh, hide that. So um, I don't I don't think it's a mistake on the part of the Trump administration when this happened. Uh, I think it was very intentional. Going back to what we've been saying, though, all along with this report, and, and to borrow the phrasing that Michael was using earlier, if the Biden administration wants to put their own mark on this or kind of put a Biden stamp on this, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be just that these uh, normalization agreements are about uh, kicking the Palestinians. And, and, and also because the trends in the region seem to be pointing to whether now or later, uh, more relations between Israel and these countries. Um, I think it behooves us all to find ways in which they can be mutually beneficial for, for more parties, um, especially the Palestinians, um, than, than with less of them. Uh, but this, is, I think, is a question now of, of when and not if for, for more countries coming along. If, and if I, can, if I can just build on that, um, it's important to understand that as disastrous as you know, de facto, uh, I'm sorry, uh, de jure annexation of 30% of the West Bank would have been, um, many Palestinians view you know, other Israeli actions that fall short of de jure annexation as, as being as bad and, and view you know, de facto annexation as taking place every day. And so um, you know, while certainly uh, I think it's safe to say that um, halting formal annexation you know, is undoubtedly a good thing, I think that I think that we're misreading the Palestinian mindset and Palestinian expectations. You know, if we expect them to jump up and cheer, um, you know, they they view that as something really bad. They they still see lots of really bad things, uh, you know, from their perspective, taking place. And so, you know, even with this, it's not as if they saw this as something that was benefiting them. So, you know, the worst thing that was facing them got canceled. But you know, they still don't see a lot of positive, uh, positive things coming on the horizon. Uh, and so I think that makes it difficult for them to, you know, stand up and, and, and be thankful to the Emiratis that they temporarily halted annexation. Um, you know, they, they just, I think most Palestinians view this as a, you know, a, a short term, maybe a short term positive, but, but ultimately nothing that really um, 
fundamentally impacts the, the bigger picture. Right. So Charles Kramer wrote in a, a question about the Arab-Israeli response. And in a sense, are Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, more positive than Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza uh, and elsewhere with regard to the Abraham Accords? Uh, specifically, Charles writes, do they see opportunities for a better economic or political outcome as A, Arabs are seen more positively by Israelis, or B, uh, Israel wants to please their new friends by treating uh, Israeli Arabs or, or the Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, better, uh, providing uh, better opportunities for those communities. Shira, um, I think you can take this one. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the um, how um, Israeli citizens, uh, pa Palestinian citizens of Israel, 48 Israeli Arabs see these normalizations, um, according to you know polls we have, um, they see this as um, more positive than Palestinians, that's for sure. Maybe less, you know, some of them, I, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but there's like positive and I don't know, uh, but less on the negative that you see. Whereas um, with Palestinians, I think it's pretty across the board that they feel that this normalization, the way they were done, uh, you know, threw them under the bus, backstabbing, you could make it up depending. And also it's, by the way, it's stuff that people tell you in private conversation and goes with. Um, I don't know, and it would be very interesting to see if um, by having these ties, Israel, Israelis, um, it helps, uh, you know, humanize Arabs, reduce fear, um, have better relations with Arabs in general. I, you know, Israel has been able to separate to different types of Arabs uh, throughout its existence. There are the Palestinians 48, who are now Arab Israelis. There are the Druze, uh, Jerusalemites. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. And, and there is something about the Gulf countries that's always been a real appeal for Israelis with their you know, glass towers um, and, and, and means. So I, I'm not sure. That would be definitely a, a positive. And I think that when we're going to start, hopefully start seeing mass tourism also in this direction, right? People coming from Arab countries. Um, I don't know if, how many on this webinar have been to a Ben Gurion airport, but it could be uh, the security checkups can be quite invasive, and there could be something that would have to be different about it um, if you want to encourage this tourism. So it'd be interesting to see where we've yet to see this uh, so far. There is an opportunity for the um, Arab citizens of Israel. Um, there's 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 a there, there's economic opportunity for everyone, but you know. Um, an Arab Israeli, a graduate of the Technion uh, with the speaking Arabic um, and being able to now go to Gulf countries to receive investments, obtain employment, uh, having ties is something they couldn't do before. And it's, it's ironically, if you will, uh, many Israelis, uh, we, we know that there were 300 to 500 Israeli companies uh, operating in the UAE through European and American other intermediaries before normalization took place. Uh, and there were a lot of Israelis with foreign passports. Ironically, it's the Arab Israelis that didn't have any foreign passports. So, so with an Israeli passport, they couldn't go. So it does open up uh, a lot of opportunity. And I think that's part of, uh, it's something that um, uh, is, is being encouraged. Um, Fascinating. Thank you, Shira. And thank you, Michael and Evan. Uh, to all my colleagues, thanks for, for, your, for your work on this uh, study. Um, and thanks for, for joining uh, for today's, today's webinar. I want to thank the audience as well. We are out of time. I want to encourage everyone to visit our website, israelpolicyforum.org, where you will be able to download the full study, the executive summary, the one-page bullet point version, uh, all sorts uh, of resources to unpack the study, which we will be uh, discussing um, uh, uh, in the, the days and weeks to come as we look to the, this week's meeting uh, with the uh, foreign ministers of Israel and the UAE with Secretary Blinken. Uh, again, while you're on their website downloading that study, we encourage you all, if you have not made a contribution, to consider doing so um, by clicking support, visiting israelpolicyforum.org slash support. Uh, a recording of today's briefing will also be on that website. And while you're there, if you haven't signed up to Michael Koplow's Thursday, uh, every Thursday morning's uh, Koplow column, uh, please uh, make sure you are signed up to receive 
uh, Michael's analysis each week and our uh, ongoing updates. Um, and please, uh, one last plug is, is to visit our, our podcast, the podcast made famous by Evan Gottesman uh, and, and carried on by our team, uh, Israel Policy Pod, wherever you get your podcasts for ongoing analysis uh, each week. Thank you all once again for joining us. We will be in touch about our next uh, uh, public webinar. Uh, thank you all for your time and thanks to my colleagues for their excellent work on, on this study. Uh, have a great uh, afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.